Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome back to the fourth installment of the Youth for Climate live series. We're so happy you can join us today. We want to make sure that the session is as interactive as possible. So please do turn on your cameras so we can see you on the video wall. And if you're here for the first time, welcome. You can learn more about the series by going to our website, which is youthforclimate.live. I'm your co-host, Ahmed Badr. And I am your other co-host, Salina Abraha. And we do have a poll for you all right now. We want to ask you in one word what comes to your mind when you hear nature-based solutions. Um, and we're seeing these words come in, preservation, conservation, and we just we can't wait to dive into these topics a little bit more today. And as we go through this hour, make sure you're sharing your thoughts by using the hashtag Youth for Climate Live. And just a little housekeeping, this whole session is also being translated into Italian. So if you want to change the language, you can do that right below. So last month, we had a really important conversation about driving youth action. You can check out an overview of that session on the Lowdown blog, and the link for that will be sent on the chat shortly. Or you can watch the whole episode on our website, which again is youthforclimate.live. Oh, and I'm seeing these results come in from the poll. Thanks, everyone who have submitted. We've got sustainability as being a big word, um, forest restoration, the safety of nature. Um, and we're so excited because the theme for today's episode is driving, driving nature-based solutions. So 2020 has been defined as the super year for nature. And with the high-level summit on biodiversity taking place in New York next week, it seemed like the perfect moment for us to come together and take a deep dive into how we can learn from nature as we implement climate policies. And of course, we'll talk more about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in this particular moment, it's so important to explore the nexus between climate change, biodiversity, and human health, as well as discuss the impacts and lessons learned from COVID-19. And most importantly, we want to hear how young people are mobilizing right now to protect, to conserve, restore, and sustainably use natural resources. To help set the context for today's conversation and to talk about how nature-based solutions fit into the COP26 agenda, we have a special message from the UK's Minister of State for the Pacific and Environment, the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith. I want to start by thanking the Italian Ministry for the Environment, Land and Sea and all the partners who have organised today's event. The young people have always been a powerful catalyst for change. And in fact, we've already seen the impacts of countless demonstrations in recent months on politics right around the world. There are 1.2 billion young people living on the planet today. And protecting it for your future is just another reason to act with urgency. Our land and seas from forests and wetlands to the fields where we grow our food and the seas, lakes and rivers where we catch fish are the source of all life. And it's not just an academic observation. That dependence that each of us has on the natural world is very real. Indeed, it is total. Well over a billion people, for instance, depend directly on forests, the same forests that we're destroying at a rate of 30 football pitches per minute. Uh, well over a billion people depend on fish as their main source of protein, drawn from fisheries around the world that are being rapidly exhausted. On so many levels, what we're doing to the natural world is the most urgent issue we face. We cannot, for instance, tackle climate change without ramping up our efforts to protect and restore nature on an unprecedented scale. But despite that, just 3% of global climate finance goes to nature-based solutions. So under our COP26 presidency, we will build alliances to ramp up political and financial support for nature-based solutions, uh, to safeguard livelihoods and the blue economy, uh, to reverse climate change, and to protect and restore the critical ecosystems and the rich biodiversity that they support. We'll build on the foundations 
led at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit, working with a coalition of nations, businesses and civic organisations, all committed to scaling up nature-based solutions and crucially to matching our actions with the scale of the crisis. And alongside support for nature, we will identify and shift those incentives that are driving its destruction, like perverse land use subsidies, for instance. We will use every lever available to us to tackle, for example, deforestation caused by agriculture. Now, we know this can only be done in partnerships. All of society, countries, business, civil society, farmers, indigenous peoples, and youth groups will need to work together to generate unstoppable momentum, to provide real leadership for a green and resilient recovery that delivers on the promises of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we need your help. Uh, you are not only the future, you are also the present. And we want to continue working with you, with your friends, your families, and your communities to protect this planet that we share. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord Goldsmith, for the thoughtful and powerful message and for highlighting the urgency of driving nature-based solutions, but also highlighting some solutions that are already uh, ongoing and that we all need to collaborate to, to increase the momentum of. So to, to kick off today's session, I'd like to invite to the stage uh, the World Health Organization Special Envoy for COVID-19, Dr. David Navarro. Welcome, Dr. Navarro. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Great to be here. So, Dr. Navarro, my first question is, what links, if any, can we draw between the destruction of biodiversity and threats to human health, such as COVID-19? And are there any lessons learned from recent events that can be integrated into green recovery plans or other policy documents? Thanks very much indeed. Could I just spend a really short time, perhaps one minute, just talking about this new virus. I just want to stress that it's not going away anytime soon. And I'm going to ask everybody who's participating in this event to just do everything possible to get their governments and any authorities they're working with to take this virus really seriously and not to present it as something mild that perhaps only has a bad impact on older people or people with other disease. I've got lots of friends who've had COVID and who've recovered, but they haven't really recovered. They're still exhausted. They're still getting out of breath when they run, and they're still not being able to play a full game of football, even though they used to be really super fit. So I'm just asking everybody, take COVID seriously. Don't treat it as a mild virus. Realise that it's going to be with us for quite a long time to come. There's no point in just imagining that a vaccine is going to come along in a few months and we'll all somehow be better. Hold it back. Keep it at bay. Do everything you can not to let the virus get ahead of us. And that does mean actually adopting all the precautions that you're invited to do. Wearing masks, keeping a distance, practising good hygiene, making sure you isolate when you're sick, and really looking after older people, people in my generation, in their 70s and so on, uh, because we are susceptible. Thank you for letting me give you that little health warning at the beginning. I'm sorry I had to do it, but you know, it's so weird. There are so many political leaders who are making out somehow that this is a mild virus and that if we just stand up and pretend that it's not serious and behave with bravado, the virus will slink away into a corner and stop troubling us. But this virus doesn't get bored, nor does it vote. All it's interested in is spreading. And right now, in so many countries all over the world, it's picking up speed very, very quickly. Now, we don't want any more of these viruses jumping across into humanity and causing all this trouble. You know, 75% of the new pathogens, we call them, that's viruses and bacteria, that come into our world, come from animals, come from insects, come from fungi, they come from other species. It's what we call zoonotic diseases. Now, 75%. So do you know what that means? It means that we have to be really respectful of animals everywhere. And there's biodiversity, this lovely resource that we desperately want to maintain and that we're losing. And 
you know, biodiversity is just so important. But if we go and dig roads and put them right through forests, if we go and trap wild animals and then put them in cages and sell them for food or for exotic pets, we're actually creating a major problem for ourselves. We're actually exposing ourselves to these kind of bacteria and viruses. And I'd just like to invite everybody to do everything that they can to respect nature and biodiversity and not to destroy, because by destroying, whether it's to get meat to eat or meat for pets or just simply to go and actually get, get the, the wood from the forest or whatever, we're actually exposing ourselves to the risk of more of these viruses. I hope that makes my point very clearly to you all. Respect nature. It's the source of life, but it can sometimes bring us really nasty diseases. Thank you, Dr. Navarro, for the thoughtful insight on the evolving relationship between nature and health and the importance of preserving biodiversity. Uh, we all look forward to hearing more from you later in the program. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome the founding partner of Global Optimism and the former executive secretary of the UNFCCC, Ms. Christiana Figueres. Welcome to our stage. Thank you for being with us today. I just unmuted myself. Um, ah, thank you very much. Good morning. Lovely, lovely to be with you. Thank you for organizing this. Um, and so wonderful to see my good friend, David, who is doing a heroic job. He is one of the most humble people I have ever known, but he is doing a heroic job on the part of the UN uh, to do as much as we can to manage COVID-19. So a big, big thank you to, uh, to David for again, taking on these mammoth tasks of dealing with uh, with global disease. It's not the first time that David does this for the UN. Um, and, uh, and we truly appreciate that, David. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've been asked to um, speak a little bit about biodiversity and climate change from a policy perspective. Um, and I would, would like to just start by reminding everyone that the conventions on both biodiversity and climate change were two of the outcomes of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. That was a good thing that we have those conventions, but it was also an unfortunate, um, if I could say so, an unfortunate start of our dealing and our engagement with biodiversity and climate because by separating them into two conventions, the result is that we have separated our treatment Every country has a team for biodiversity, a team for climate change. Every institution has a team for climate change, a team for, for biodiversity. And, and that has not served us well. The fact is that these two things are inextricably linked. If we continue to destroy biodiversity, we are accelerating climate change. And the acceleration of climate change is one of the highest threats to the preservation of biodiversity. There's no way that we can de-link those two. They are absolutely one and the same. And honestly, it's taken quite a while for all of us to understand those very, very um, close links between the two. Now, um, it's quite ironic that 2020 was planned as a super year for climate, a super year for biodiversity, a super year for oceans. It was meant to be a super year for nature. But, uh, you know, I've often heard the saying, if you want to make God laugh, just make a plan. And um, that was our human plan, a 2020 super year for nature. And the, uh, the humor of that is that nature decided to make it a super year for humanity for us to learn the folly of our delays and of being blind to the very, very close interaction between biodiversity and climate. So if, you, if anybody remembers, and maybe those who are listening are too young, um, but if anybody remembers this year, this very year, we began with fires, floods, everywhere. 
fires in Australia. We now have fires in California. In between there, we had fires in the Amazon, fires in Siberia. It has been the year of mammoth unprecedented fires. And we have had floods that are unprecedented. And we were hit by this pandemic that has caused such immense human um, human suffering. So I am celebrating that one of the, d- despite the pain, and I take David, Dr. Navarro's warning at the beginning of this, of taking this virus very seriously for our individual and our collective human health. And at the same time, I am very sensitive to the pain, the health pain that so many have experienced and to the fact that we have millions of people who are jobless and millions of family families who are really having a very, very difficult time without their expected income. So we cannot minimize that very painful situation. At the same time, we have to be able to hold that reality in equal standing with the reality that we are learning lessons from this pandemic that will help us as we address other global threats such as climate change. And it is uh, it, one, of, one of the main and most urgent lessons here is that we actually don't have the time or the resources to deal first with the health issues, then with the economic um, recession and the economic paralysis, then with biodiversity, then with climate, then with inequality. We just cannot do that. We did not ask for all of these global crises to converge in 2020, but they have. And the only way to deal with that convergence of the crises is actually to converge the solutions. So my request to young people is to remind everyone that you speak to, every within your your area of influence, up and down your influence chain, to remind everyone that this year is the monumental, monumental message that we have to integrate the solutions. We have to use the economic recovery packages that are already being financed to ensure that that new capital that is going fresh into the economy goes into the economy in a sustainable way that is helping us with biodiversity, that is helping us with climate change, that is helping us with inequality. We cannot afford that silo thinking that we had in 1992 at the Rio conventions, at the Rio summit. We have learned that all of this is integrated and we have to be able to deploy that capital in an integrated fashion. And finally, let me just remind young people that the 12 to $20 trillion that are being injected into the economy as recovery packages are debt, debt capital. No government has the scale of cash flow um, out of their reserves. The governments are going into debt. Who is going to pay for that debt? It's not David and it is not me, sadly. That debt will be paid over time by young people through your taxes. So the lesson is, and the warning that you need to raise to everyone is, if you are being put into debt about something that you are going to pay, you better make sure that those in charge that are making decisions are investing that money to your benefit and not to your detriment, either because of the disappearance of biodiversity or because of the acceleration of climate change. This is your topic. This is your challenge. Please help us to raise the voice of prudence and of responsibility. That money has to be injected into the economy, but it better be money that is planned for the long term, that is planned for you to have a future that is safe and where you can thrive and prosper. Thank you so much. I thank you for never failing and ceasing to come with the passion, uh, the energy and and the commitment that I think inspires us all to remember what's at stake. Um, This is so important. Um, And we look forward to hearing from you in the next segment um, after we hear from a few more speakers. Thank you so much, Ms. Figueres. 
Um, and I want to underscore a bit of what we're talking about, what's at stake. The latest science shows us that nature, including biodiversity and ecosystems, is deteriorating rapidly worldwide. So the most recent Living Planet Index released earlier this month by WWF shows a 68% decline in populations of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish in the past 40 years. And this is important not only because we're seeing a decline in species population, but also because they're a key measure of overall ecosystem health. So this year's motto for the International Day of Biodiversity is our solutions are in nature. What does that mean? Well, there are solutions for climate action, which are inspired by, supported by, or even copied from nature. And this is what we call nature-based solutions. So we're here today to learn more about this topic, and of course, to share experiences and to gather great ideas on how young people can lead the change. And this is where you all come in. We have a few questions for our audience to answer by either scanning the QR code you now see on the screen or clicking the link in the chat. Your input here will help guide the upcoming conversation, so please do add your thoughts. And the first question we'd like to ask you is, how are you conserving, preserving, or restoring nature? We have A, planting trees and or supporting ecosystem restoration, or B, advocating for the inclusion of nature-based solutions into my country's climate planning, or C, learning about and raising awareness of the value of nature, or D, Honestly, I don't know what I can be doing to conserve and preserve nature, but I'm here to find out. So let us know what you think. We can follow the results together. I'm just trying to read this. This is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. All right, the biggest chunk looks like learning. Learning. Yeah. yeah. It just underscores, I think, the, what this series is trying to achieve and, and I think just the importance of the storytelling end of things, right? We have to learn about but also raise awareness and it's a kind of a two-pronged approach. Yeah, and so many advocates also on um, into integrating this into country climate planning. Um, and the great part is we have our speakers who have a lot to say about these results, the roles that they've played, the actions they're taking. Um, so I'd like to give them a chance to come onto this stage. So we're very excited to welcome Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, Archana Sarang from India, and Claudel Petri de, Ro de Rose from Canada. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. Would also uh, like to welcome back Dr. Nabarro and Ms. Figueres. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Hi, everyone. So I think Perfect. before we dive in, we'll just start off with a few introductions for our speakers. Welcome to our big yeah. stage. <laughs> Absolutely. So Vanessa is a youth climate justice activist from Uganda, and she was recently appointed as a UN Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals. Archana is a member of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, and Claudel is the president of the Quebec Association of Physicians in the Environment. So we will be having a Q&A session later on. So if you think of any questions as we're going through this conversation, please do submit them in the chat and let us know which speaker you'd like your question to be directed to. So let's dive right in. So Vanessa, we'd love to start with you. Uh, first, we all want to extend a huge congratulations on your new role as one of the 17 UN Young Leaders for the Sustainable Debe Development Goals. Um, I had the pleasure of being part of the previous class, so I know how special of a program it is. So uh, congratulations again and best of luck. So today, climate demonstrations are taking place all across the globe. COVID-19 has forced activists to find new ways of protest using digital activism to demand ambitious action. As a young climate activist, how do you think young people can continue holding policymakers accountable in this new context? And how do you, how would you like to see nature-based solutions included in national recovery or climate plans? Thank you so much. Um, I believe that young people, even in this period of the pandemic, have continued to hold the leaders accountable so basically what I would say to them is to continue doing what they have been doing. Uh, today we had the global 
climate strike across uh, different parts of the world and uh, I already did my strike and even in this pandemic we have been able to hold the leaders accountable because our planet is in a mess our earth is in ruins and we want to see this change so young leaders have to keep speaking up to keep demanding in the safest way possible while following the necessary guidelines because every crisis must be treated as a crisis. And when it comes to nature-based solutions, I feel like the potential of nature-based solutions hasn't yet been fully unleashed to the public and to the leaders. We lose the fight against climate change if we do not involve nature. I believe that restoring our ecosystems, protecting our ecosystems, sustainably managing our ecosystems will help us in reducing on the emissions in the atmosphere. So now is the time for the young people, for everyone else to start speaking about the nature best solutions. And it isn't just about the forests, there is more to it. The wetlands, the peatlands, the mangroves, among others, the coral reefs. So it is really a very, very wide topic. And I think these are solutions that will help drive our planet to where we want it to go. We cannot fight climate change without nature-based solutions. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Again, for highlighting the, just the importance of, of young people in this, uh, in this mission and in this journey, uh, and also just highlighting what we've already done, what we're already doing, but also what we still need to do. So thank you so much for that intervention. Yes, and thank you so much for continuing to strike even now. Um, we want to move now to Archana. We also have some congratulations for you on your recent appointment to the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group. And we also hear you've been selected to give an opening statement at next week's UN Biodiversity Summit. So congratulations for the, all that success. We wish you the best. Um, and first, we'd love to hear a preview of what you plan to tell decision make makers next week at the summit. And then second, based on your perspective as a climate leader and a member of your indigenous Korea tribe, how do you think that young people are currently driving nature-based solutions? Uh, Johar, everyone, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm glad that I have received an opportunity to address in the Summit on Biodiversity. I would be raising three pertinent issues in the Summit on Biodiversity. One is that, yes, we indigenous communities are protecting the nature and forest, but we'll be able to continue to protect the biodiversity only when we feel secure, for which it is important to respect recognize and enforce our rights over our land and forest. Second, I feel there's a need to revisit our approach and ambition on conservation and protected areas. Uh, doubling protected areas to cover 30% of the globe, as some want to see in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, is something which will lead to immense human rights violation. And it could lead to the biggest land grab of the world history, and for which I feel the indigenous community needs to be the leaders of biodiversity conservation, not victims of it. And third, I would like to emphasize is that we youth are and will be facing the impacts of biodiversity crisis. Despite this, we are marginalized, unrecognized, and underrepresented in decision-making spaces. More proactive steps are the way forward to ensure intersectional and intergenerational equity. And talking about uh, my Kharia tribe and the youth, what they have been doing in terms of the nature-based solution is that uh, I would start about talking about my uh, Kharia tribe 
which i belong to is that the community members of khadia tribe are no longer uh, living in a homogeneous nature rather they are living with all the other tribal communities as well as and talking about my name uh, which is archana soren the meaning of my surname in my khadia traditional language means rock and there are other surnames which is ba which means paddy there are other surnames which is kullu which means tortoise there are other surnames which is kiro which means tiger so when we say that you know nature is a life and identity we really mean it and we have the element of nature in our name as well as and talking about uh, our uh, nature based solution Uh, we indigenous communities over the years have deeply rooted and intertwined with the nature whether it is our agriculture practices whether it is a spiritual beliefs whether it is our food habits whether it is a healthcare systems also i would like to say that my father was a indigenous healthcare practitioner also today he is not with us but what i remember from him is that he was not a professional healthcare uh, you know in terms of the degree but he learned those indigenous healthcare practices from my grandfather and that is how the importance of transition of the traditional knowledge and practices comes into and that is why it is important for we youth indigenous leaders also to go back to our leaders and go back to our elders and learn from them these traditional healthcare practices agriculture practices and food habits as well and then talking about covid 19 i strongly feel that the indigenous communities where the land uh, where the rights over the land and forest were recognized were more resilient as per my research study also and one of the thing which i witnessed is that they were much more in a safer space in terms of the food security uh, uh, comes into picture and that is why i feel when we are talking about post covid recovery the nature based solution needs to be emphasized and indigenous community needs to be the main stakeholders in the nature based solution and free prior and informed consent should be the guiding principle in nature based solutions and local institutions needs to be empowered and having said that i would like to also highlight one of the challenges uh, 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 related to nature based solution is that when we talk about nature based solution it is often termed as a forestation programs and as i have seen in my own area also as i am from an industrialized area which has high number of industries extractive developmental projects in order to compensate the industries which are being set up the afforestation programs are being pushed forward but the afforestation programs are violating our rights over our land and forest the species which are being uh, planted in the name of afforestation is highly environmentally damaging and also destroying the food security of the indigenous communities and i would also like to say that uh, develop extractive developmental projects and nature based solution is something i feel cannot go together because if extractive developmental project is happening it is threatening our life and our existence we have solutions we have nature based solution but only when we feel secure will be able to continue and that is why it is high time that we make this transition we make this shift towards greener economy and nature based solution taking indigenous communities as an integral part of it thank you a oh, round of applause for that uh i think we are so lucky to have you here today to get a preview of that and the decision makers next week are lucky to hear from you as well thank you so much for being with us agreed thanks again archana for really really thoughtful thoughts and and just, just the insightful and and, and passionate um kind of answers to the to the initial question so thank you we're so lucky to have you here with us and i'm very jealous of everyone who will get to hear you next week um now i'd like to turn to cladel um thanks again for joining us uh we want to circle back to where we started examining the links between the environment and health Cladel as a physician can you tell us about the links between nature climate change and human health how do you think we can better integrate public health priorities into climate action plans especially as we move forward post covid-19 um yeah hi um thank you hamed uh, and the youth for climate team i'm i'm actually really happy to be here today 
Um, this is a very complex question and you can have, you know, presentation hours long about it. So I'm going to try to summarize it up in four minutes. <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge, but hopefully we'll, <laughs> we'll get it done properly. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a young physician and for the last couple of years I've been trying to better understand the links between climate change and health and nature. Um, and in a very simple way, and you know, COVID-19 aside, climate change is actually the biggest threat to health of the 21st century. It, was, it, it will be responsible to an excess of 250,000 deaths by year 2030, so that's in only 10 years from now. And those deaths will be mostly from undernutrition and infectious diseases. It is important to understand that health is not only the absence of disease, it's also a state of physical and mental well-being. Um, and what most people don't know about health is that access to healthcare is actually, is it what is most important to our health is, and you know, doctors are often not happy to hear about this, but healthcare services are responsible of only about 20% of our health. The rest is social and environmental determinants, such as the air we breathe, the food we eat, the places we live, and how much money we've got. Um, and so that's why climate change is particularly dangerous for our health. We have to see it as, you know, a risk amplifier. It threatens every single determinants of our health in, you know, in every single countries across the world. And people are also often surprised to hear this, but even here in, you know, in, in Quebec, in Canada, in the Northern Hemisphere, we are not, you know, we still face the, the, the risk of climate change. We are not, um, we're not spare. Climate change increases the risk of extreme weather events. And as we highlighted before, events like floods, hurricanes, um, heat waves, droughts, wildfires, it makes it more difficult to breathe. It stresses our heart and our kidneys. Um, it triggers depression and anxiety. And so, you know, it creates a global instability and, you know, it force even some people to leave their homes. It, in, you know, it, it makes it more difficult to get access to food and to clean water, and it helps the spread of deadly diseases such as cholera and dengue fever. Um, so I'm glad we're talking about, you know, we're trying to shift into solution and because we, we could look at, at, at it the other way around and see climate change as our biggest opportunity to improve health around the world, but also to reduce health inequities between and within countries. And that's, if, of course, if we do fight climate change properly, which we trying to get on the right track, but we are not there yet. Um, the World Health Organization currently estimates that one in four deaths today is linked to the environment. Air pollution alone kills seven million people. Those are preventable deaths, um, deaths that could be avoided. And as a young physician, you know, that, um, that really comes to uh, close to, to my practice. Um, as much as we have created environments that are today detrimental to our health, it is possible to turn that around and to actually look to create environment, both in urban and rural settings, that actually you know, support, support, promote, and enhance our health. Um, but to get there, we need ambitious climate goals. We need to reduce the use of fossil fuels and ensure that everything we do is actually based toward the protection and restoration of our natural ecosystems. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of showed us how, you know, precarious the global economy could be. And, you know, it has also demonstrated the biggest inequalities in health. People didn't die equally in front of COVID. Some communities were more affected than others. And sadly, those communities are often the one, the, the same one that faced the biggest burden of climate crisis. Um, and now we have the, the opportunity to build back betters. Uh, government are looking at ways to spend thousand amounts of money into sustainable solution. And it's sort of up to us to tell them what this healthy recovery looks like. Um, just to give you an idea, at, uh, at K, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, where I work, um, we have produced a report uh, showing that you know, in Canada alone, a healthy recovery could create 1.3 million new green jobs and save 100,000 lives. You know, those are the opportunities that we currently have at hand. And I, I don't see why, you know, I don't see a valid ways, reason why we would miss that out. Um, and so what are those solutions? What did we put forward? And, you know, nature was a central piece in our report. Um, and for instance, in, in cities like, like Montreal, uh, where I live, if we do get a proper green cover, so if we actually plant trees and gardens and, you know, bike paths in the city, we could reduce air pollution because trees are, you know, amazing. They, they, they can, you know, reduce, they capture over 3,000 pollutants in the atmospheres, um, and they also protect us from the deadly heat islands. Um, and some, you know, more interesting literature in, in medicine shows us that, you know, nature and trees can help reduce anxiety, obesity, diabetes, and even some cancer. And so this is particularly exciting because, you know, those, 
non-communicable diseases are the leading cause of deaths worldwide. Um, and so as the WHO and this, their Healthy Recovery Manifesto, they, they reminded us that COVID-19, you know, really, really highlighted the intimate relationship that we do have between, you know, us people and, and our planet. And we need to better recognize that moving forward. And, you know, nature in its very, you know, in its beauty and its uniqueness can be uh, very inspiring and I think can lead the way into a, a healthy path forwards in the, in the coming years. Thank you so much, Claudel. And one thing I think that's really important that you highlighted among many things that you highlighted that are very, very important um, are kind of this, this idea that, you know, integrating public health priorities and driving nature-based solutions, both processes are, are synonymous and one amplifies the other. And I think the more we realize that, the, the easier our path will be. Uh, it's going to be a tough one regardless, but I think it will make it a bit um, kind of more realistic and a bit more intersectional as uh, uh, Ms. Figueres mentioned earlier. Intersectionality comes up every episode in some way, shape or form, and that only just highlights its importance. So thank you so much for that intervention. Uh, Mariha mentioned in the, in the chat, uh, for nature-based solutions, it's important to foster intergenerational collaboration and mentoring so the traditional knowledge learned through generations could be sustained and used. I couldn't agree more. I think the intergenerational um, component of this is really, really key. Um, and again, it goes back to the storytelling and the advocacy. We have to be able to advocate, not just as, as young people, but for folks that may be older and even younger than us. So thank you so much, uh, Maria, for that, uh, that intervention and for that comment. And if you have any more comments, please do just send them in the chat. Yes, thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, we are getting some audience. Uh, thank you, Maria, uh, Zoe, who's talking about the dialogue between people and government on how climate affects the economy um, and how that could then affect the, the current debt and future debt that may come. Uh, Jacob, who's underscoring that the future is for all of us. We can leave no one behind. Um, and so, yes, please do keep sharing your thoughts. But also, we will be moving to a Q&A section in just a moment. So please do submit your question if you haven't. Do it now. And now I'd like to turn to Dr. Navarro and Ms. Figueres, who've been listening and clapping and nodding. Um, could you tell us, I guess Ms. Figueres first, in just a few sentences, what are your reflections on the discussion that has happened so far? Well, here's my conclusion. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God that uh, we will be followed by these fantastic, fantastic uh, young leaders um, who are mature and wise way beyond their age. I've, I've always known that uh, future generations, because I see it from my own daughters who are in their early 30s, they're just the, the capacity to analyze and to take um, and draw conclusions is so much quicker than ours. I think maybe, David, it's because our brains are losing cells every day. Isn't that true from a medical perspective? That once you get <laughs> once you get to a certain point, don't don't we lose cells? We do, we do, we do. You're you're confirming that as a doctor. Yeah. I, we can't hear you. We're aging all the time. It's very unfortunate. Yes. Well, what the fortunate thing is that while we're aging, uh, the young people are coming up. And it's just, honestly, it is it is so heartening to know that there is this degree of passion, of understanding, of wisdom that is coming out. Having said that, let me warn you that I do not participate with those older people who say, thank God the young people are going to save us. Because I don't think that that's fair. I think that there is still a huge responsibility on the shoulders of those of us who are still sitting perhaps way too long at the uh, tables of decision and that have uh, more influence for whatever reason. We, we, there's no way that we can walk away from our responsibility and simply hand it over to future very capable, um, very capable generations, because I don't think that that's fair. I think that it's our responsibility to still make sure that we get at least on the right track. We are totally heading in the wrong direction. I think it's our responsibility to at least 
change the direction of travel, which doesn't mean that we're going to solve things, but at least change the direction of travel so that then young people can get on a different trajectory and take us much farther and much further. But I, I, you know, and I would be very interested to hear from our three young women. What do you think about that? Because my, my sense is it's irresponsible to say, okay, thank God, these are brilliant women. In this case, all three women, thank they nice about that. Um, these brilliant women, therefore, I'm going to step back and turn over my responsibility. But I would love to hear from you. What do you think? Where do you think the responsibility of our generation, David and mine, where do we, to what point do we still maintain a responsibility? And at what point do we hand over the baton to your much more capable hands? Yeah, and I think we'll have a moment to answer that. So while our youth speakers, um, our younger speakers are thinking about this, uh, I just want to hand the floor to Dr. Nabarro. Um, how about you? What are your thoughts coming out of this, this discussion? Um, um, thank you. Last year, I was given the chance to contribute to the climate summit organized by Mr. Antonio Guterres, uh, in, um, that was in September. Uh, I was responsible for the work stream on nature-based solutions. I was working closely with China and New Zealand, but also many other countries on this agenda. And you know, the thing that really came out from that work that I've also felt in listening to the, to, to, to the presentations from the three speakers here is that we really uh, need to introduce the notion that nature is valuable into every single decision that is made anywhere. It's taken me too many years to realize that decision makers in government, in business, in local organizations, in universities, do not give enough value to nature as key to life, health, and the future. And I really felt that coming through strongly in all three of the presentations. And there, it was lovely, actually, that Claudel mentioned the WHO manifesto that's called, it's titled Prescriptions for a Healthy Clean Recovery. It's on the web website of the World Health Organization. If you can, please look at it because it's really giving us six messages. I'm gonna give you them in super, super quick language. One, value nature, because it's the key to life everywhere. Two, make sure that all energy is natural. Number three, make sure that food and agriculture respects nature. Number four, bring nature more into cities. Number five, make sure that nature is always underlining resilience because it's so vital to help particularly poorer communities as they cope with some of the stresses they face. Number six, stop using taxpayers' money to finance the destruction of nature. That is totally unacceptable. Let's all stand up for that. I'm, I'm doing my best. I feel that as somebody who has some contact with leaders, I have to go on and it's really great at the Biodiversity Summit next week. There's going to be a real effort to get world leaders to stand up for nature and say they're not going to do this anymore. And I would love it to be just a really strong platform of every group of young people, every group of students in universities and in schools, and always calling leaders to account to say, prove to us that you're not destroying the nature it is key to the earth that we're going to inherit. Thank you for the inspiration. I could say more. I was so delighted. <laughs> and I love it that our dad was showing how to heal using nature. I've learned, learned so much from you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, and just before we launch into to questions and an opportunity to go into dialogue, we have a special video message uh, that we'd like to share. So please do allow me to introduce uh, Her Excellency Maria Angela Zappia, Italy's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. I truly welcome the opportunity to take part in this Youth for Climate live series. It is inspiring to see so many young people engaging on vital issues for all of us and for the planet. This is a priority for Italy, especially as we prepare for COP26. Nature-based solutions are essential to reverse climate change. Only by radically transforming our approaches to production and consumption will we be able to rebalance our relationship with the planet. The dramatic blow of the pandemic is yet another call to act now. We have no time to waste. Italy is promoting vocally a better, more resilient and sustainable recovery with the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement as our compass. The health emergency has exposed the connection between global health, biodiversity loss and climate change. Health and the environment are global public goods that we must protect through a coordinated multilateral action. As the incoming presidency of the G20, Italy will put them at the core of its agenda for people, planet and prosperity. Italy is among the promoters of the new Pledge for Nature that will be adopted on September 28th and has actively contributed to the incoming Summit on Biodiversity. At the 2019 Climate Action Summit, we put forward the flagship initiative on green energy transition and participated in the Coalition on Nature-Based Solutions. Italy Italy's multifaceted action builds upon our experience in protecting the huge environmental heritage of our country. The green transition lies at the heart of our national COVID-19 recovery strategy, in line with the high ambitions set out by the EU Green Deal. We have created a knowledge platform on climate and a committee on natural heritage to mainstream ecosystems related consideration of all stakeholders in decision making processes. We will continue to promote the inclusion in climate action of all vital forces, including young people. Last December, we successfully organized the first ever youth COP of the Barcelona Convention for Environmental Conservation in the Mediterranean. Now we are working to make your, make your voice heard at the global level. As we look forward to the Youth for Climate event in Milan, we count on your passion and on your continued action for accountability and real change. Indeed, you can be the drivers of the change we all need. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your message. It was also recently announced that Italy, as part of its G20 presidency, will be hosting the Global Health Summit in 2021. It's very exciting news, and the summit will hopefully chart a course towards a better future for our generation and those to come and to bring together these topics we're talking about today. So, Ahmed, shall we kick off the Q&A? Let's do it. And so while our speakers come back on screen, I just want to thank you all so much for all of your great questions. I wish we had time for all of them. But if we didn't get to yours, please do ask our speakers on social media. You'll be able to see their handles in the chat. And so we have a couple of questions here. First, we have a question from Felipe, which we'd like to address um, to all of you. Uh, and that question is, what are some of the best examples of nature-based solutions? You know, you're all working to drive and mobilize support for nature-based solutions in your own respective professions. What are some examples you've encountered through your own work? Uh, maybe in a couple of sentences, we can uh, start with Dr. Nabarro uh, and then go on from there. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I go to Costa Rica, Christiana's country. What they've done there is they've made certain that they budget for nature and they value nature in the national budgeting. They brought together the Ministry responsible for energy and the Ministry responsible for environment. They've created sustainable tourism and uh, nature-based agriculture. Their example is being picked up by more and more countries. They're not alone. Perhaps there are about 30 countries now following suit. Let's push more and more countries to value nature properly within their national budgeting. Thank you. 
thank you. Um, and to our younger speakers, there's also an opportunity if you want to answer uh, Christiana's question. We are running late on time, so I think this is the best time to get into, into all of it. Um, Claudel, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, and I, I go back to something that I referenced during uh, during my intervention, but I think there's there's two core, well, as a physician, there are two things that are quite important for me when it comes to nature-based solution. One of them is making sure that our cities are um, actually environment in which nature has a big role to play. Um, that means ensuring that we have at least a 40% green covers, and uh, that could mean from creating parks, bike paths, uh, community gardens, green roofs. You know, there's plenty of, of room for us to be creative, uh, but we need to ensure that we have trees in our city. And the other thing is to make sure that people actually do have access to nature. Um, especially in some countries, you know, nature could be seen as far away from, from cities, but, you know, and, and, and hard to access. But we need to make sure that, you know, either by creating national parks and by ensuring that we create areas that are preserved from, you know, industrial consumption, um, people have access to them. And not only people that have the financial capacity to do it, but, you know, equitable access for everyone in, in the country or in the region. So I would, you know, those are two things that I think are very um, are very good for our health and uh, and to protect the environment. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. Woody, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's really important what Claudella said because I remember in school um, the times that you would get to see a game park was during a school trip that happened like once in a year. So I think this needs to change so that people can have that uh, easy access to nature, to wildlife, uh, by being creative, as Claudella said, having urban forests, having game parks within the cities, because many times we know game parks to be in really far places. And I think uh, the, the other solution I think that is really important is one that I resonate with, and that is with the forests, because I see that our forests are being destroyed, our forests are burning, they're being cut down, and these don't just benefit us, they're homes to different uh, species of animals, homes to trees, homes to plants. So I believe in us embracing the protection and restoration of our forest cover, not just for us, but also to avoid the extinction of the various species of animals and also the various species of plants. And um, to to answer the question that was asked by Ms. Christina, um, leaders have learnt the art of putting the responsibility on young people by praising us and saying that we are doing everything we can to see that we have a good planet, to see that we have a good future. Unfortunately, they only stop at these praises. And this puts all the burden on the young people because you find that even on every panel that you're on, they're asking, what should the young people do? What should the young people do? What are they doing? The question should be, what are the leaders doing? What should they do? <laughs> Everyone is putting the responsibility on the young people. I believe that children have to be in school. They have to be playing games. They literally have to be having fun, enjoying their childhood, not being worried about a catastrophic present and a really scary future. So the responsibility goes back to the leaders who are the adults, enough of making the children and turning children into adults in the room. We really need the, the leaders and the adults to really um, just be the adults, please. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Figueres, would you, would you like to offer your reflections? Well, very clear. So thank you very much for that uh, confirmation. It is the way that I feel, but um, I really just wanted to hear from you because it's uh, it, it, it's a it's a difficult balance to um, open the conversation for young people, which who always bring very very good ideas and suggestions. But as Vanessa said, not put the burden of the responsibility and the decisions there. You, you we've got to, as she said, act like adults. Um, and sadly, there are 
few adults around the decision table these days. However, David and I continue to push. Thank you. And I, I want to give the final uh, floor to Archana. Um, what are your thoughts, whatever question you want to answer, final reflections for, for us all? Uh, uh, thank or my intervention in terms of plastic pollution. So we indigenous uh, communities uh, make leaf plates out of uh, uh, leaves, uh, wherein which is an alternatives to use and throw uh, plastic plates. We are also making uh, water bottles out of uh, vegetables like pumpkins and bottle guards. So the uh, vegetables, we are uh, eating it uh, uh, for a livelihood, but the outcrust of the vegetables are also used uh, as a uh, uh, water bottles by drying it up and we are also making mats out of leaf and we are also making uh, pots out of clay, clay so these are certain commodities which are alternative to plastic pollution and i feel these commodities needs to be emphasized and seen as a way of uh, green recovery and for which i feel the government and the decision maker needs to invest on this and promote these practices of the indigenous communities so that they earn their livelihood as well. And uh, talking about Ms. Christina's uh, uh, question on, you know, how do we work together? I strongly feel that we need to rethink who are experts. For me, uh, my indigenous leaders are the ones who are illiterate by the formal education, but they are the experts. So I feel uh, the knowledge which is coming irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, and irrespective of any barrier, the knowledge and wisdom needs to be respected Expected, and we together need to come together for an intergenerational dialogue because we need your experience and we need our uh, eagerness and our promptness and our desire to work for our nature. So I think it should be a collective action wherein we are having our elders and youth together working for climate action. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, this is a conversation we could have forever, but unfortunately, we don't have all of that time. So thank you for being with us today. And let's keep the conversation going through to the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming, China next May. Um, and so what we'd like to do now is we have a special message from young people in China about their expectations for next year's summit. So let's hand it over to them to watch this video. Hello, my name is Yuling, and I'm 29 years old. As a young person and a Chinese, I'm very excited that COP15 will be held in Kunming next year. And my expectation for this event is that it can have real impact on people's daily life. I think the post-2020 global biodiversity framework needs to be communicated to and owned by the widest audience possible so that people can enjoy a higher level of biodiversity exposure and be part of the solution for biodiversity loss. Hello everyone, my name is Wang Lei. I'm 25 years old. Now I'm very lucky to participate in preparation for the CBD COP15 and negotiation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Like myself, more and more young people in China from all kinds of backgrounds are actively pay attention and contribute to conserve nature and biodiversity, as you can see in these pictures. I'm looking forward to adopting the blueprint of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in CBD COP15, which will lead us all to take actions right in this urgent time. Hello everyone, my name is Tian Lu and I'm 25 years old. 2020 is a super year for biodiversity, and the youth in China have made their own contributions. With their efforts and aspirations, young people are dedicated to promoting the implementation of the CBD, carrying out projects and researches on biodiversity, and mobilizing resources to raise social awareness on biodiversity conservation and climate change. CBD COP15 will be held in Kunming, China, where the youth will have massive opportunities to be more engaged in decision-making process and voice our opinion on biodiversity loss and conservation. Our solutions are in nature and our future lies in the youth. Thank you so much. That's so incredible to see the messages from young people across the world. Um, we want to thank all of our speakers and also Dr. Nabarro, who had to leave us um, for an urgent matter, and also Ms. Figueres. And of course, all three of you, Vanessa, Archana, Claudel, thank you for being with us today. Um,
if I had to sum this up in one word, I would say this was fiery. It has gotten me fired up, ready to go. And, and I'm so thankful for all of you for your encouragement. Yeah, same here. I would say energizing, fiery, all the synonyms to what Selena said. Uh, but again, that's just how we would sum it up. We would love to hear from you um, and how you would sum up this conversation and the conversations we've been having thus far. As some of you may remember from last month's episode, we launched the Sum It Up competition where one winner will be selected to participate in the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event in Milan next year. All you need to do is pick one episode from the Youth for Climate live series and sum up your key takeaways either through a one minute video or an infographic. And uh, you can find out more by clicking on the link in the chat. We can't wait to see which episodes you choose and to sum up. So next month's episode, everyone, will be themed around driving empowerment, protecting the most vulnerable. And you can register now also by going to our website. Um, we hope that um, you all found this session super inspiring and we'd love to hear more of your thoughts. So let's continue the conversation online. Um, and please turn on your videos if you haven't so that we can say goodbye. Thanks for joining us. We'll see Bye. you next month. Bye. Bye